So, Bill, we got together at my house in Point Loma to have a little chat, a very casual chat during this pandemic time um, to put together a little uh, talk about San Diego's graphic design culture during the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And such a rich uh, time, so much interesting work being produced here that most people don't know about. And specifically to look at a couple of different examples, sort of ends of the spectrum of print culture in San Diego in the post-war era. You know, uh, there's this history of aerospace being a big uh, tech uh, industry in San Diego, uh, especially during World War II. One of the big aircraft manufacturers was called Convair. Convair got taken over by General Dynamics. And so Convair became a division of General Dynamics and they built a big plant out in Kearney Mesa that was a beautiful modernist structure in about 1958, designed by top-notch Los Angeles architects. Uh, a beautiful campus for this massive company. General Dynamics had a history of really great uh, design. So they, one of the sort of um, iconic examples of their attention to design is this campaign called Atoms for Peace. Atoms for Peace was designed by this uh, world-renowned Swiss graphic designer, typographer, and it's a campaign of these incredible posters that people collect nowadays. Yeah. And that just kind of gives you an idea that they really put attention into their design, their marketing. Do you know if there's a sort of a reason for that, why they were so design focused? I mean, was it seems even for the time that might have been unusual. Or well, that... I, I don't know. I think for science and technology companies yeah. like General Atomic, for example, um, another closely related company, it was important to appear um, on the cutting edge. It was yeah. important to appear contemporary. Right. Hence, for their building choice, it was modern architecture. Yeah. For their uh, print materials, advertisements, their all their publicity stuff, it was important to appear of the moment, in advance, really. Right. Um, so that was something that was pretty commonplace, I think, huh. for science and technology companies. One of my friends, Bob Matheny, uh, came to San Diego because of a designer named Stan Hodge, who had taught at UCLA and taught at Cal State Long Beach, where Bob was one of his students. And he was uh, one of the directors of the art department at Convair. So Bob actually came to San Diego to work for Stan Hodge in 1958. And while he worked for Stan Hodge, um, Bob would make things like this. These were basically sort of cover sheets for different kinds of uh, collections, uh, reports, um, things like that. Mm. You know, here, for example, another design that Bob was involved with is the stenographic handbook. Yeah. You know, printed on some kind of vinyl product. It was a cover for some kind of volume of instru an instructional manual, a handbook. And then another guy who uh, came along, his name was Bert Brockett. And this is a design, a similar kind of cover design uh, that was done by Bert Brockett. Mm -hmm. Bert um, became the uh, head of the design section uh, for a long period of time during the 1960s and later. Uh, one of the things that happened while Bert was working at General Dynamics is the company produced 
a set of playing cards, which are sought, much sought after today. Mm -hmm. When were these actually done? So these are made in 1965. 65, okay. Yeah. The playing cards did not just come out of thin air. They actually were an extension of a kind of a management game, a training exercise that had been developed in-house for management at General Dynamics. With the set, they include this handy, um, explanation and it says these space cards tell a story the story of america's man in space programs the hearts deal with the human element the clubs portray the sciences the spades show products and the diamonds depict modern aerospace management <laughs> without which the other three elements could not be successful dot 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 there's something very hopeful about all this that i don't really see it doesn't feel like the tone would be the same nowadays. Like in the mid '60s, I feel like there was some sort of like sense of you know going forward into this bold new future. And this was all very exciting and you know a little bit idealistic even. Absolutely, which is, which is part of the charm, I think, of some of these things. It it definitely is. I mean, the idea that this this is the space program before man has set foot on the moon. Some of the most important ste steps uh, were created through the work of Convair here in San Diego. And of course, it, the space race itself was really an extension of missile making. Research going into intercontinental ballistic missiles yeah. that was utilized to put rockets into space, to put people on the moon, right. et cetera. Yeah. But it's a war machine at its very fundamental its core. Yeah. core. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then look at this one. This is nice. Uh, the Six of Clubs is a combination stars and stripes, as well as a variety of plummeting missiles yeah. coming down in every stripe. Yeah. So the design that goes into this, but the undercurrent, the underlying yeah. uh, message or the underlying content right. is missiles and bombs. Yeah. It's, it's phenomenal. Yeah, it's a strange mixture of kind of playful, fun illustration and death and destruction raining from above. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then there are some that are a bit more humorous, referring to visual elements of, uh, that we associate with uh, the space program. A nice illustration of squeezable steak, steak in a tube for the astronauts oh, right, to consume. Of yeah. yeah, that's great. Here's a kind of a mind at work with all the various disciplines Mm -hmm. physics, astrophysics, etc. They borrowed the uh, famous Vitruvian Man right, yeah. rendering. Yeah. And so they actually give a credit in certain pieces of ephemera related <laughs> to awards and listing the different artists. They credit Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. He's a good guy to have on your team. If yeah. You're going to be putting something like this together. Uh, and then, of course, the, the famous Mercury 7 astronauts, most of whom visited the Convair plant in ah. San Diego. A whole team of the best illustrators, designers, uh, people in the art department at Convair were involved in the production of this really cool set of cards. Uh, Masami Daijogo was one of the main uh, artists involved. He did a lot of the cards. Mostly, I I believe that he did these kind of rich, almost painterly cards. So I know for a fact that this is Sam Dijogo. Similarly, I believe that this the monkey, monkey in the yeah. cockpit is yeah. also Dijogo. And I believe the portrait of Amelia Earhart. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're all stylistically pretty similar, yeah. same techniques. 
But, but some of those also might be Phil Kirkland because he had a similar kind of style. Mm. But what I recognize in Phil's work is this kind of disjointed, angular look, right. which is kind of distinctive. And then in contrast, a very different style are these sort of photorealistic space images, really detailed images of uh, various kinds of spacecraft. Yeah, these are wonderful. Um, yeah, and so you think this is the same? So so those are by John Centivit. Yeah. I know that for sure. Yeah, these are great. Similarly, this is a beautiful uh, black and white image showing multiple screens or windows and a spacecraft passing yeah. in in moving past. It's very Kubrick, that one. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to get too ahead of this, but is there anybody left to sort of talk to about these cars? Burt Brockett mm -hmm. um, was the man behind this whole project. And Burt is still alive today. Okay. I am involved in ongoing discussions with Burt, but he's a fantastic resource. Uh, the space cards made by General Dynamics Astronautics were um, really well received in the professional world of graphic design and so forth. So from the Art Directors Club of Los Angeles, they, they received a certificate of merit for the design of a complete unit um, in their 20th exhibition of advertising and editorial art in the West. And here is the original um, certificate with the stamped uh, Art Directors Club seal. Um, and it refers to this product, uh, the, the playing the space cards, and it lists the people involved. And then for some of the comics characters, um, they credit the National Newspaper Syndicate, National Periodical Publications, and finally, Leonardo da Vinci. We well, even have Superman here. I hadn't even noticed that. Right. Yeah, so that's these, remarkable. that's that's where these characters are coming yeah, from. Yeah, I, I didn't see that. They had oh. to uh, communicate with the um, people that held the copyright yeah, for I some bet. of the comic book characters. Wow. Um, so some of these other artists, you did. Do you know much about their history after this? Did they stay with General Dynamics? Did they move on to other things? How much do you know about that? So Burt Brockett stayed there for quite a while. I think re he retired towards the 80s. Um, and he saw a number of generations of people come through the office, uh, come through the art section. Um, most of the others did not stay at General Dynamics past the 1960s. Mm. It's remarkable what a, a perfect cross-section yeah. of this world, um, this set of space cards uh, serves as, and, and a great introduction to the graphic design scene at that time in San Diego. So one thing that I thought would be interesting um, for people is to look at, at this story and then also kind of contrast it with another object um, being Guy Williams' book, Poems for Painters. Right. And I felt like these two objects uh, allow us to describe um, different ends of the spectrum, mm -hmm. maybe, yeah. in San Diego's print culture right. in the 50s and 60s. In 1963, Guy Williams, a visual artist, went to some owners of bookstores. At that time, there was a sort of a circle of visual artists, painters, and people involved with writing and publishing and bookstore owners that formed a sort of an interesting group. Lafayette Young had a shop that was partly an art gallery and partly a bookstore. And this was on La Jolla Boulevard, is that the? Yep. Yeah. It was called the Center Gallery. Yeah. And it was staffed by a poet named John Ruchel, 
who used to write for uh, Art Forum magazine. Mm. He would write about local art shows at the Eye Gallery and stuff like that. Yeah. Guy Williams went to Lafayette Young and got the money to publish this uh, handmade book called Poems for Painters. And the book consists of what Williams called at the time typewriter drawings. And each page is a work that is done in reference to a fairly well-known contemporary artist at the time. And each composition is made entirely on a typewriter. So, and with each image, there's the name of the artist, which makes it very easy to understand. It's a very interesting idea. Art referential, art about other art. Mm -hmm. It depends on the reader or the viewer's um, understanding of who these artists were. I wanted to look at a few examples from this book, Poems for Painters, to understand um, the, this idea of concrete poetry. Mm -hmm. um, basically, a visual uh, image that uses letters, language, words, but uses them in a visual way. Yeah. And in this example, only working within the confines of the typewriter in a very creative way to create that image. Yeah. Uh, and so I thought we could look at Duchamp, um, which refers to the famous Marcel Duchamp painting, Nude Descending a Staircase. Yeah. And so obviously using upper and lower case type, um, he's done a kind of a, a an analog of Duchamp's painting. Mm -hmm. So, but he's including language. In another example, ah uh, yes, Hokusai, a famous Japanese artist who did, was renowned for his portfolio of uh, views of Mount Fuji, a hundred views of Mount Fuji. So here, similarly, there is a kind of an ideogram, mm -hmm. a picture created with the words. So it, it, the shape of it suggests a mountain, a landscape, obviously, and the words and the letters also refer to that. So it works on multiple levels. But then you can move to a different kind of more conceptual example. Right. So here you have the name of the artist at the top, Surat, who was known as one of the inventors of pointillism, mm -hmm. this kind of very fun, a combination of small points to make a picture. Here, he's done away with this kind of shape recognition, yeah. and he's gone for a more abstracted, more conceptual uh, image where it's just a grid is so prevalent in modern art at the time, geometry, yeah. architecture, the grid. And here he, so he simply made a grid and just used the period on the typewriter to suggest the pointillism of, that goes with the artist. It's very reductive. He's just sort of boiling Seurat down to like- Points. The, the utter essentials of his art, which is lots of tiny little stippled dots. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. But then another more complex image would be um, Keen. Right. So, well, Walter Keen. Well, or Margaret. Or, Keen. Well, Margaret. at the time, probably would have been Walter, right? Yes. I thought it was Walter. So, so this one referring um, to uh, Walter and or Margaret Keen, sure. who were uh, very successful in San Francisco. There's a movie that came out a few years ago about her life, um, doing those paintings of little children with great big eyes that were so popular and also super well known in the sort of popular culture. Yeah. Here, he's done another one of those kind of reductive processes 
where he has simply filled it with dollar signs. So again, he's reduced it to its essential element, just like the Sarah. That's right. So Sarah's the dots. The essential element here, even he a step away, yeah. even a step away from the Sarah, where he's taken an actual element yeah. that you would see. In well, this the is art criticism, basically. Yes. It's a form of art criticism. It's yeah. an art criticism. Thank you. <laughs> What's also very interesting to me is that the, the work in, in Guy Williams' book, Poems for Painters, published in 63, is incredibly similar to the approach that an artist in Czechoslovakia named Yuri Kolar uh, published around the very same time seemingly a world away yeah. and doing almost the exact same kind of thing. And it uses some of the very same artists, but um, interestingly, uses very different images in some cases. So the Joseph Albers from Yuri Kolar's work in yeah. 19, published in 66, compared to Guy Williams Albers, the same idea, but very interesting, Williams has used complete words for colors, mm -hmm. making you think color when you look at those spaces. I read orange in the center. Here, Yuri Kolar uses the letters of the artist's name to create the image. So they really work in very different yeah. ways. Yeah. Is Williams aware at all of his context at the time? Guy Williams went to New York in about 1962. Okay. So he, he would have been may, exposed to a lot of things. He may, he, they were exposed to a lot of yeah. things. Um, but sometimes at a distance, mm -hmm. sometimes through the mail, yeah. which was the way this kind of concrete poetry uh, and other poetry, experimental poetry at the time, was typical for it to be exchanged back and forth through the mail. You wait for your copy to arrive of yeah. someone's book. Yeah. Um, but whether Guy Williams was aware of Yuri Kolar's work is very hard to say. Yeah. And it is so curious because Again, there, there. It's almost like that. It's in the air. Mm -hmm. It's, it's some. There's something in the air. As evidence of that, there's this book, which features a whole lot of Guy Williams' work in this, in the context of typewriter art yeah. uh, of the '40s, '50s, '60s, uh, where it belongs. Guy Williams' work now has a position in retrospect in history um, as being a, a critical contributor to the broad pantheon of concrete poetry.